Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Dr. David Wild, anesthesiologist and vice president of performance improvement here at the University of Kansas Health System, sitting in again for Dr. Steve Seitz, our chief medical officer. We are coming to you live from the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. We have some very special guests this morning joining us here in the studio. Uh, Chancellor of the University of Kansas, Dr. Doug Gerard. Uh, in Studio B, we have Chris Wilson, our System Vice President of Integration and Innovation. Uh, via Skype, uh, Dr. Jennifer Scrimsher, Infectious Disease Specialist at LMH Health. Um, and of course, uh, here in studio, not last but not least, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, our Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. We're gonna spend some time today talking about what we have seen on the Lawrence campus, uh, what we've learned uh, in supporting the university to manage um, uh, and really, I think, successfully bring a campus back um, from, from being closed at the uh, end of the spring and uh, also to talk about the impacts of all of that on the Lawrence and Douglas County populations and what LMH is seeing. Uh, so we'll dive into that soon, but first, Dana, how do we do overnight? Yeah, last in the roll call, first in your hearts. <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, yeah, we don't wanna, um, the numbers aren't good. They could be a, a lot better, unfortunately. We are seeing this all over our community. We're seeing this really all over our state and country as well. So um, right now we have 36 in the hospital that are active infection. 16 of those are in the ICU, but the good news, only four of those patients are requiring ventilators right now. So that means the other, um, the other patients that aren't on the ventilators are probably needing high flow oxygen. And again, we are doing everything we can to prevent um, intubation and going on the ventilator. And then we do have 35 who are still in that recovery phase that are still in the hospital, so not the active infection. Hayes does have a, a couple more than yesterday. They have um, 18 patients, 15 of those are active, and then three recovering. So their numbers are staying high too. At one point they were higher than us. Um, their numbers have, have come down a little bit, but still in those high teens and really in that, that tough spot considering what their total capacity for hospital beds is over there. So. You know, the, the ICU numbers, the ventilator numbers, uh, that's been an interesting conversation. Yeah. We heard, I think, this morning as well on a, a sort of a regional ICU mm -hmm. director's call that yep. that pattern of less patients on the ventilators and what we've learned about how to manage yeah. the um, uh, respiratory needs of COVID-positive patients has led to less ventilators than we expected, mm -hmm. uh, at least early on. So. There is a bit of good news there, is we're not seeing ventilator shortages as uh, we've found better ways to manage those patients. And I'm sure our ICU colleagues and pulmonary critical care docs um, could, could tell us more about that. Uh, but that can fluctuate too, because we did have um, you know 11 patients needing ventilators for COVID. So I think those numbers will continue to fluctuate. Right now, it looks like it's, uh, it's about as good as it could be. Great. Before we jump too much into our discussion, Jill, do we have any uh, reporter questions this morning? Yeah, uh, Channel 9, Donna Pittman, she'd like to know, there's a new study out of England that suggests COVID-19 antibodies don't last long, so someone could get it over and over mm -hmm. and over again. I'd like to know what the docs think about the study and its implications. Dana, yeah. I'll start with you. So yeah, it's a perpetual, uh, perpetual COVID Groundhog Day, which is not good for anybody. <laughs> um, this is not new. There have been a lot of studies looking at durability of antibody responses, so antibodies themselves, the level of antibodies you have in your blood at one point in time. In general, um, people have waxing and waning amounts of antibodies. They also have the memory B cells that create the antibodies. So there are also memory T cells, but if we're specifically talking about antibodies, there have been other studies that show you have antibodies out to, to four months or more. Uh, but there's other, been other studies, I think, that show antibody decrease even sooner than that. So there are various time points in all of these published studies. We do understand, however, I think it's, it's more um, uh, general knowledge now that if you do have more um, either asymptomatic disease or more mild disease, you probably have less concentrations of, of peak concentrations of antibodies compared to somebody who has, say, severe disease or who is in the ICU. So um, it's not really uh, new. What we're hoping from the vaccine is that they can induce an antibody response that is more durable, it lasts longer, but also to make sure that you have those memory B cells to make the antibodies once you come into contact with the virus again. 
The question of reinfection is a separate question, and it is kind of uh, harrowing for sure. We understand that with regular coronaviruses, you can probably be infected, you know, uh, nine months, 12 months later with the same exact virus. And unfortunately, as we've seen from the reports, if you do get reinfected, um, you can either have no symptoms or you can have worse symptoms. Um, so there's a spectrum too, and we still haven't fully elucidated all of that and what's gonna happen and what individual is gonna be at more risk for more symptoms and maybe critical illness, um, and which one is going to have maybe less symptoms. So those are all good questions. We are still looking at that. There have been very few published cases, but there certainly is the possibility of repeat infections. Hopefully, um, with better therapeutics, if you do have a repeat infection, You'll be able to get an outpatient therapy, hopefully with vaccination, that will protect against repeat infection and worse symptoms. The other thing to remember is that even if you have worse symptoms with reinfection, there's always that possibility you can still spread the disease, and that is another really significant aspect of all that. I think it's also really important to understand study design. So this study did not follow patients, the same patient from one point in time um, to a second point in time weeks or months later and check their antibody levels. It was a population but based study that looked at one antibody, IgG, um, and it looked at the prevalence in the population uh, at point A and point B and what they found was the prevalence of IgG antibodies in a sampling of the population was lower at point B than it was at point A. Um, that's probably not as good of design as following individual patients. Mm -hmm and seeing how quickly their antibodies uh, decrease by following multiple antibody types to understand the full uh, immune response and, and what the durability of that immunity might be. So I think it's an important point in time to understand. It actually might speak more about um, the uh, sort of population rates yep. of infection um, three or four weeks before the, sp the samples were taken. But, but nonetheless, it is useful in our understanding, and I think I agree, it's a little bit of Groundhog Day. Um, it's really hard to compare this antibody study to that antibody study when they have different designs. So great questions. Um, plenty more to come on that as mm -hmm. we understand more. Um, I just, I think I agree with Dana. It's not, it's not a definite red flag that we're all going to be reinfected every two or three weeks, um, but, um, but it's also not um, a study that shows that uh, without question there's durable immunity for months and months. So more to come. All right, I think that's all the reporter questions we have, correct? Anybody lurking? All right. Proceed. All right, so to set up our conversation about what we're seeing in Lawrence, what we've learned and, and really um, uh, what I think has been in uh, many ways a, a successful return to campus. I wanted to share a couple of slides to sort of tee up what we continue to see across uh, the Midwest, uh, even in our states, uh, just as maybe a, a comparison to what we're gonna talk about in Lawrence. So this is a, a slide that you have seen before. I've shared it the past two or three weeks. This is a per capita look by region. So Northeast, Midwest, South and West for the population adjusted number of new cases um, per day, the seven day average number of new cases per day. Um, and this is yesterday's data, so it doesn't include the cases that were reported overnight, but you can see um, a little bit of different picture here than, than maybe we saw three weeks ago. Uh, all regions are trending up, which is consistent with the national data that we're seeing. The Midwest uh, continues to be the most active region for spread. Um, with a, a peak rate now of 350 cases per million on average per day, um, which is higher again than New York in March or the South in July and August. Um, uh, and um, a slope of that line that is <laughs> not showing any change, right? It's not slowing down, it's not decreasing. We've not rounded a curve, at least uh, by these standards of new cases. The next slide um, is the same sort of look, but at the state level. I've added a few states for comparison because they're states that we're hearing stories of pretty significant challenges. Um, but uh, the look on the left is the population adjusted number of new cases. Uh, the look on the right is the population adjusted number of patients in the hospital. 
Uh, again, just proving the point that across the Midwest and here again, Utah was added uh, specifically because our colleagues in Utah uh, at the University of Utah and, and uh, Intermountain and other healthcare delivery systems across that state have been sharing with us really how challenging their situation is now. Uh, so it's a good comparison for us, I think, uh, to, to pay attention to. But nonetheless, um, at the regional level or the state level, we're seeing a fairly rapid increase in the number of cases. We're seeing hospitalizations at or near uh, the peak numbers um, for many states, and yet we really haven't seen that in Lawrence. So with that as a backdrop, yeah. Chancellor, um, <laughs> I think from your perspective, uh, what would you like to share and um, maybe what what is uh, on your mind as we think about wrapping up this semester um, and planning for the future? Planning for spring. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, uh, We've got some great experts with us today as well, Chris Wilson and, and Dr. Scrimshire, who have been so key in, in our reopening of the campus this fall and continued efforts over the course. We're in our ninth week now of the semester, mm -hmm. um, knock on wood, and, and you know we take it literally one day at a time, but, but our efforts to de-densify the campus, the uh, mask order, which is indoors and outdoors on campus and the compliance has been remarkable it, it truly um, you know it's it's rare that you see somebody who's not complying with that as you walk across our campus or mm -hmm. through any of our buildings so couldn't be more appreciative of how the students faculty and staff have really stepped up yeah. to do that and you know we did a, a very aggressive uh, testing of everybody on the way in uh, at the beginning of the semester and, and identified uh, a number of cases and that enabled us to isolate and quarantine as we needed to do and really things have gone the opposite direction of what we're seeing in the state ever since we've seen our numbers continue to come down steadily we continue to do uh, prevalence testing so we, we randomly sample our population uh, every week and we see you know those numbers that positivity rate is less than 0.3 percent at this point which is pretty remarkable and if yeah. you look at our faculty and staff it's essentially zero um, so it really has come down dramatically uh, of course we're doing symptomatic testing as well but interestingly that number has dropped pretty significantly so both we have two sites for that our Watkins mm -hmm. Health Clinic as well as um, uh, the University of Kansas Health System has a testing site for symptomatics as well and combined those are running about five percent positivity rate for symptomatics which means mm -hmm. for one thing there's other diseases on our campus right now right. other than COVID and we're starting to see that play out uh, with 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 uh, people getting sick and not with COVID. So, um, but but really, it's uh, you know we're headed the right direction, not the wrong direction, which is reassuring as as we get you know sort of three fourths of the way through our semester. And I'd like to add, yeah, to that we we see um, stories all the time. There's a couple of in uh, large universities who have had to pause or shut down or stay at home, and I think um, University of Kansas has done a really good job just as you elucidated that. Well, and it's it's certainly our university community, but it's also our community community. Yeah. So or the, the relationship and partnership with Lawrence and with Lawrence Douglas County Public mm -hmm. Health, I think has really been our key to success to keeping the numbers down in the community as well. Yeah. And, and that partnership is, has been critical to, to allow us to achieve what we have. Yeah, Dr. Scrimshire, um, from your perspective, uh, both uh, in your support of the county, but also um, as uh, an infectious disease specialist and healthcare provider at, at L, uh, LMH. Uh, what, what are you seeing now and, and what do you think has been key to the success in, in both uh, the city of Lawrence and the, the county of Douglas County? Um, first, first of all, I want to reiterate what Dr. Broad said. The um, partnership between the university, the uh, medical center, LMH, and Lawrence Douglas County Public Health has been critical. I can't, I don't think we could have done this uh, without uh, cooperating as well as we have and continue to do. Um, you know, Douglas County, Lawrence Douglas County is a little kind of, I call it a little beacon in the state of Kansas. It seems like we're surrounded by a lot of um, areas that are lighting up and yet our numbers have continued to decline. Um, we were actually able to move into the green with um, the gating criteria and schools and I'm hoping that will hold out. Um, I do have some concerns a bit. Uh, we've been holding steady as far as our number of patients. We really haven't had a huge patient load, but over the weekend and earlier this week, that number rose pretty sharply. We're back down today to about our baseline, um, but there has been an overall increase in cases. It's still lower than um, what we had had previously, 
but it's I'm hoping it's not an early sign of something to come as um, other like the KC Metro area bleeds into Douglas County as far as positivity. Um, the number of cases has gone up, the number of hospitalizations went up, and then we saw a, um, a little spike in our employee positivity, which as you guys know, is often an indicator of something to come. So fingers crossed, but I've been super proud of this community. Um, Dr. Marcelino and the public health department have been crucial in um, implementing mandates to help keep the numbers low. So we've had a mask mandate since um, sometime this summer. We closed the bars temporarily. We've worked with the bar and restaurant association to, to slowly open back up and, and uh, prolong the hours um, so we can do that safely and working that with them on their plans in general. Um, but without the community doing what they need to do, uh, without the um, combined cooperation of all of the entities that I named earlier, um, it wouldn't have been possible. So I wanna thank the community first of all, and then everyone involved in this effort. It has been, um, as you know, a daily, um, sometimes grinding, but always uh, rewarding uh, effort in bringing the school back. Yeah, you know, Jen, um, I would agree. It truly has been a remarkable collaborative effort um, from a number of entities. Uh, I think it is um, a story that is well worth talking about. Um, I think there are lessons to learn, as you've mentioned, about being able to reopen and support the community in a way um, that is transparent and, and can be safe. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, while I've worked with everyone here in the studio uh, before and would say, um, I think, we would all agree we're friends. I'll, I'll run with that. Um, I have been really privileged to spend time with you um, and your team, so thank you uh, personally for that because um, there have been more than a few moments where I think we're all just a little bit weary and uh, we've been a great support system for each other and I think that's an important part of our success, so thank you. Uh, Chris Wilson. You know, one of the things that we've heard here from both the Lawrence perspective and, and uh, the KU perspective is that um, we've had a process to test and understand where disease is, and we've also shared that information fairly transparently um, on a periodic basis uh, with uh, the public. So uh, from your perspective, um, what, what do you see we have learned from our testing strategy? What might we expect? Um, to recommend as we um, see changes in the community and prepare for the next uh, semester? Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the first thing we've learned is what we've all talked about here today, and that's the importance of collaboration uh, in, in these efforts to really keep a community as safe as we can during a pandemic. Um, so I, I am equally proud of, of all the people on this, uh, this show this morning, uh, all, the, all the new friends and colleagues that I've uh, interacted with at the county, at the university, uh, with the health system at LMH, uh, with Watkins Student Health uh, throughout the uh, throughout the semester, and I think that's really the biggest lesson is that uh, you can uh, help mitigate uh, the impact of a pandemic when your community and all its key stakeholders really do come together with common goals in mind about how to keep everybody safe. Uh, you, you know, right now we're right around a one percent positivity rate uh, for uh, the campus testing. Uh, activity. Uh, we're averaging around two to three positives a day uh, over the last seven to 14 days. Uh, and our symptomatic uh, positives uh, are down as well as our uh, positivity rate for symptomatics as well, as Dr. Gerard mentioned, in that sort of five to 10% range. And, uh, you know, compared to Douglas County, uh, they're at a four and a half uh, percent positivity rate from the most recent statistics. Uh, so we're at or below uh, where Douglas County is in, in the campus testing. Uh, but then when you compare it to the rest of the state, which uh, is probably closer to twice that level as Douglas County, um, eight to 10 percent positivity rate. Um, uh, you, you, you start to think about what is this sort of impact of, of uh, all the collaborative efforts and testing that we're, that we're taking. And, and I think um, testing is important and it is an important piece of the portfolio as we like to think about. But as I know, we've talked about in this program, the sort of Swiss cheese model, it's not just about testing and probably it's primarily about individual behavior when it comes to, to masking and distancing. 
and and so I, I think uh, the, the second lesson uh, learned would be that uh, it, it's a it's a portfolio of interventions that we have to undertake. Uh, and if I had to prioritize any one of those, it's masking and distancing an individual behavior to be as safe as possible. Uh, maybe then the third the, the third lesson learned is um, that the formalized setting, so the classroom, the campus, uh, you know, the organization, the workplace, uh, those are places where when infection prevention practices, primarily masking and distancing, uh, are implemented, um, can operate safely. Uh, it's the informal settings that we continue to see uh, challenges. And, and I think more and more as we head into these colder uh, winter months, um, it's the household uh, where we're starting to see more of that activity uh, from a spread uh, standpoint occur. Uh, and and that's, that's probably the biggest lesson that uh, we could take with us heading into, heading into the holidays here uh, is just the need to um, recognize that the holidays will need to look different this year. Uh, and, and that uh, as we had a mass migration of individuals coming into the uh, Lawrence community uh, in August, uh, we're going to have a mass dispersion of individuals uh, return to their uh, home communities. Uh, in many cases, and probably in virtually all cases, we'll, we'll have higher, uh, higher spread uh, than that that's in Douglas County right now, at least in the state of Kansas. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's, that's something that's on our mind is how we can really emphasize uh, not letting up on uh, the the good practices that have been um, been adopted on campus throughout the semester as individuals return to uh, more familiar and uh, more uh, informal settings in their homes and their hometowns. It's in there. Thanks, Chris. You know, Dana, um, along the lines of the importance of infection prevention practices mm -hmm. um, and individual behavior, you know, our uh, infection prevention team has actually spent a decent amount of time yeah. on campus mm -hmm. really observing yeah. behavior. Yeah. Uh, and I know, uh, Chancellor, you've talked about the importance of that and, and what we have seen, um, but maybe comment both of you a little bit on what, um, what we have seen on campus and why that's been important. Yeah. Sure, well, um, you know, the, the team has been sort of walking the campus and the mm -hmm. facilities, secret yeah. shopping, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, just to, to really help us understand and, and occasionally identify some spots for us where maybe we haven't been quite as compliant and occasionally, whether it's in one of the athletic facilities or, yeah. or elsewhere on campus, and has helped us uh, tighten up a little bit when we needed to when we saw that maybe we weren't being as, as strict as we were, but also helping us understand how to put fans in the stadium or put fans into a field house uh, or into the volleyball arena um, by walking those facilities, mm -hmm. working with our teams, our athletics uh, team, as well as our facilities folks and walk it and map it out and figure out how we can do that as safely as we can using all the things that we know to do with masking and distancing. And so um, it's, been, it's an ongoing actually effort right now and continues to be and we're really appreciative for that. Yeah, ongoing, absolutely. Um, just like you mentioned, athletics, other buildings, um, band. Really, um, you know, Amanda Gartner, Lance Williamson have been ready to go and take a look at all those physical spaces to look at that. And, um, you know, if there's other calls for more, um, you know, our infection prevention and control team will be there to help uh, mitigate and, and show ways to reduce risk as much as possible. I think that's a, a great part of the story is that um, I think, you know, part of this collaborative effort has been the fact that when um, we have resources and expertise to share with the university um, and the chancellor's team around how best to manage these things, to make them as safe as possible, not only have we been able to support those, but then um, I think the entire, your entire team, Chancellor, has been able to take those and really create a meaningful way to to make it happen, and so I think that's been a success story as well. It certainly has. I, I think Jen kind of, uh, Dr. Scrimpture alluded to it. I think everybody's getting a little tired. Mm -hmm. uh, the the weir weariness of all this is, yeah. is certainly starting to set in. We're hearing that from our faculty, from our staff, from our students yeah. of, of the, the, the just the shutdown of it all has is, is really been, I think, hard on everybody and continues to be a challenge yeah. uh, as, as we go and I think head into the holidays. I, I think that's uh, both concerning a challenge and probably a risk for us all. Mm -hmm. So as we um, get ready to move into questions from the community of one more slide, um, I think is uh, uh, an opportunity to, to sort of garner closing thoughts around our Lawrence conversation. Um, so this is Johnson County data reported as of yesterday. Um, this is uh, sort of showing in the blue bars the percent of the total cases to date that have occurred in an age group 
and the gray bars being the um, proportion of the population in general um, that is that age group. And so uh, we've seen over time the 10 to 19 year old group increase from being very low like the zero to nine age group, mm -hmm. um, but it's still proportional with the population. But we remain with this uh, situation where the number of infections or the percentage of the infections uh, in the 12 to 29 year old age range is double the portion of the population. Um, and that's clearly not what we're seeing in our KU community in the Lawrence population. And I know we've talked about a number of reasons for that, um, but I think this, in my mind, highlights the need for such a comprehensive plan. Um, and um, also, I think, is a reason for us to continue to talk about the fact that this picture is not what we're seeing in Douglas County or on the, or on the KU campus. And so as we wrap up this part, Chancellor, anything um, you'd like to say as we think about messages for, for the rest of the semester and, and moving into next? Sure, so, so um, first of all, we, we need to stay the course. We, we're, we have proven that it's working and, and uh, we need to stay the course with that, with all the collaboration and the efforts that we're doing. Uh, we're in the process now of thinking about what it means when everybody does disperse mm -hmm. and, and what kind of testing we're going to do in, in that setting and certainly at least for some folks who may be going to home to high risk environments in terms of uh, susceptible people in their home or need testing to be able to travel. There are some states that require you and countries require you to have a test if you're going to come in. So we will uh, work out ways to do that and then really thinking about next semester, the spring semester, which we've delayed by a week. We've canceled spring break and and delayed the mm -hmm. semester for a week again to try and just have one episode of mass migration. Yeah. Um, but we will need to do entry testing again in the spring just as everybody comes back. And I, you, you, you mentioned it earlier that uh, one of the challenges right now is while we seem to be in a little bit of a bubble right now given what's going on around us, um, that's where our people are going to go when they mm -hmm. leave. And so they are going to be coming back from areas, uh, uh, unfortunately, that seem to be much hotter than we are right now. So, so we're going to have work cut out for us, I think, as, as we regather for spring semester. Definitely. Dr. Scrimshire, uh, from uh, LMH or uh, Lawrence Douglas County perspective, anything you'd like to add? Stay the course, dig deep. I, I know it's tough. Um, but we're doing the right thing and we got to continue to move forward. Um, be proud of what the community and the campus has achieved. Um, and and uh, take pride in that into this winter and continue to do the things you need to do. Mask up, keep your distance, wash your hands. All right. Well, it does appear that our conversation this morning has led to lots of questions. Jill. Um, how about we take some of those community questions? Yeah, I will just say our community is on fire and they got some hard questions. Mm. But first, a shout out to Paul Snyder, who says that KU professor Donna Ginther was on National mm -hmm. News last night talking about her research that Kansas did regarding mask mandates. And I want to know, Chancellor, do you think that, uh, and doctor, do you, what do you know about the study? And do you think we could get her to visit with us about oh, that? Oh, I'm sure Donna would be willing to do that. She just reads, leads a great research team in, in both economics and public policy and, and is uh, a guru at looking at big data. Um, and uh, her study really has shown the, the positive impact mm -hmm. of a mass mandate in reducing the number of daily cases by anywhere from, from six to eight in, in a given community. Um, so, so you know, the data is there to show again that what we're doing works if, if we can all just buckle down and do it. All right, I'm going to drop name she, drop. I'm sure she. Would I'm going to tell her the chancellor to said. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, Sarah wants to know. She's with USD. I'm guessing 497, and she wrote me this very lovely um, letter. But I'm going to jump right to the heart of it, which is. She believes that the public schools and public educators in the community are shouldering more the burden for maintaining community health. Is there any way they can do what you guys are doing at KU and do it in a public school setting so they can get their kids back to the classroom? I might pitch that one to uh, Dr. Scrimshire, who's uh, been on the front lines of this, along with Dr. Tom Marcellino, who's our public health officer for Douglas County, and we've all been struggling to figure out how to help the school districts uh, work their way through this. Uh, Dr. Scrimshire, thoughts? Yeah, we're getting ready to implement a, um, a screening program for the community and we've started with education. So it involves testing of um, faculty and staff as well as students, uh, uh, baseline testing and then periodic surveillance 
papers and pull that out in the near future. Um, and then after we get that settled, we'll move into the rest of the community, vulnerable populations, businesses, um, yeah. It's a it's a huge undertaking. We've been uh, thing, as all of you know, is very important um, in our response and uh, controlling this spread. So yeah, we're hopefully I think mid November is our uh, goal to get this started. Um, but look forward to that. I think Dr. Scrimshaw, if she can hear me. Um, we're, you're cutting out on us a little bit, so if you can just kind of really face the computer and, and talk into that microphone, that may help it. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Jen. And I, and I know with uh, working with Lawrence Douglas County Public Health uh, and Lawrence uh, Memorial Health that they are mapping out a testing strategy for the for the K through 12 system um, and, and will be uh, executing on that in the next several weeks. So trying to do exactly what, what your listener was asking. Okay, Isaac wants to know, as far as fans in Allen Fieldhouse, how will they be keeping people safe? What's the ventilation like in there? Well, Chris, I think you may have walked through the field house a little bit with the team. Maybe you can comment on that. I, th I think we reassured ourselves the ventilation is, uh, the air movement is good. It's not air conditioned. If it happens to be August, it's not so pleasant. But, <laughs> mm -hmm. but the yeah. air movement is actually quite good. And, and I know uh, working on how, again, the team and Amanda Gardner and team yeah. working on how to, to uh, what kind of density we can actually support in there, which is going to be a challenge. Yeah, I, I know Dr. Scrimshaw and I in the last week have had a chance to, to do some walkthrough uh, at Allen Fieldhouse, and uh, I'll, I'll say that that I was um, pleasantly surprised uh, by the actually the, the level of ventilation that is in that building. I think there may be a, a misconception that because it's an old building that the uh, the ventilation system uh, might also be dated, but it, it's uh, it's it's a substantial amount of air that moves through that building and creates a, you know ironically a pretty pretty good pressure. Um, the, we saw a couple folks when the systems were on open doors and hair was flying back and uh, it was uh, it was a it was a good uh, reassuring um, visit for us I think uh, and and of course we've learned a lot uh, as well over the last couple of months with football and uh, with other organizations that have had uh, fans in the stands about the importance of distancing uh, about the importance of masking uh, and about the importance of following all of the rules that we've been uh, promoting uh, in, in gathering settings uh, for uh, the last several uh, months uh, through the pandemic. So uh, more to come and more details to be worked out. Uh, but uh, I know uh, Kansas Athletics is working closely with uh, Douglas County uh, Health Department uh, with uh, people on this phone or on this uh, on this media briefing uh, to make sure that uh, we can do it as, as uh, safe as uh, as we can, uh, given the circumstances. Barbara wants to know, Dr. Wild, on your first graph, can you define the states included in the Midwest region? They're going to pull the graph back up. Yes. Um, off the top of my head, I don't want to be mistaken, but these are the, the regions displayed are the U.S. Census um, uh, regions. Um, if you go to the COVID tracking project and look at the regional graphs, you'll see there's a link in the bottom that allows you to click the U.S. Census, and that will take you to the exact list. I don't want to leave anyone out, um, but uh, it is available there for reference. All right. Virginia is kind of asking again about the schools reopening. She's mm -hmm. wanting to know, do you think that that will lead to more cases in the community in Lawrence? <laughs> well, um, before we jump to the Lawrence perspective, I might say, um, you know, there are a lot of activities associated with the return to school. Um, and I don't think uh, that our highest risk series of activities around returning to school occur in the classroom for most ages. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, the question might look, or the answer to that question might look different depending on where you are, uh, meaning different school districts having different uh, guidelines around what sort of activities can take place and how they're managed. Um, but I think in general, there is a significant amount of evidence that says uh, that since the return to school, the rate of infections in children is increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, the American Association yeah. of Pediatrics shares that data now weekly. Uh, the CDC periodically updates, but not on a regular schedule. Um, their data as well. Both of those data sets would say there are more 
students or more children, I should say, maybe not students, uh, more children positive now and that that rate is growing consistent with the, the overall community now. So um, in general, I would say the answer um, is as schools reopen, do we expect to see an increase in cases? I think so. Do I think that um, it is a definitive thing that will push us over the edge um, to a, a very rapid rate of spread? Uh, probably not, uh, but I think it depends on individual behavior and, and how we act as a community. And uh, Chancellor, you might uh, talk a little bit about the difference between return to campus um, and return to um, elementary or secondary education campuses because a large portion of the classroom hours or coursework hours this year, or this semester, I'm sorry, were no longer in person, correct? Correct. We significantly de-densified the campus mm -hmm. and so, um, you know, the, the time that people are actually in a classroom and when they are, it's in a, an appropriate socially, mm -hmm. physically distanced fashion with masks and, and appropriate protection. Um, and to be honest, we have not had one documented incidents of spread in the classroom. And I was on a call yesterday with over 60 of my counterparts across the United States, and they have all said the same thing. They've yet to have a documented incidence mm -hmm. of transmission in the classroom. It's more likely the activities that are going on around it and what happens when they leave the campus. And mm -hmm. so I think we can create very safe spaces to conduct our educational activities, um, but you have to look at it in the context of the whole picture. And so if you're walking into safe space and you walk right out into a high-risk environment, it probably doesn't matter very much. Yeah, I, I remember pretty clearly um, you sharing with us that you thought it was very possible that the safest place students could be was in the classroom. I campus. believe that to be true. I still believe that. And frankly, right now in the state of Kansas, our campus is probably the safest yeah. place you could be. Yeah, I think in general, if, if, if you can find ways to de-densify the classroom, whether it's um, kids of certain last names go one day for hybrid and then the other last names, the other half of the alphabet, um, using masks, distancing the, the desks as much as possible. You know, there's always the risk there. There's a lot of risk when kids are getting together outside of the school. But there's also a risk to the teachers, administrators, counselors, the other support people. If they're meeting together in meeting rooms or eating lunch together, that is probably a higher risk of spreading it between those adults in that uh, institution than it's really the kids to the adults. Jill, maybe a couple more? Sure. Donna says that she saw recently some pictures of Greek houses hosting an event with their parents, no social distancing, no masks. She wants to know, do, do the Greek houses continue to be the bad apple that threatens the whole bunch and what can you do about it? You know, the, the, the houses themselves have actually been very good throughout this in terms of no visitor policies and, and really they've, they've tightened down their hatches pretty much. They've changed how they deliver their food. They've changed their sleeping arrangements from what is traditional. Um, but, but the bigger challenge is, is uh, portions of the Greek community that aren't living in those houses but actually live out in the community itself. But quite honestly, since uh, sort of early in the semester when we had some issues around that, uh, working with with the county and the city and, and passing some ordinances that, that would allow uh, us to have some authority to shut down those should they occur. We, to my knowledge, we've not had to shut one down. Um, so really people sort of got the message and, and have really modified behavior and I'm really proud actually of the way they, they've all stepped up to, to manage this. Nancy wants to know, is there a way to share your plan publicly and with other communities so that they might replicate what's happening? So uh, I think we're all very willing um, to share what we've learned. I think that's part of the reason we're talking today. Uh, I think we've Absolutely. tried very hard um, to share that and um, in a number of ways. Uh, uh, also the, the Board of Governors, uh, other, other areas uh, to share with other universities. We have, and, and actually if you go to kuprotect.edu, uh, protect, uh, uh, our entire plan is there, mm. including all the data, all the dashboard data from the time we began to, to yesterday. Um, so it's all out there. Uh, we're, we're happy to share it. Happy, uh, feel free to take it, steal it, use it, uh, whatever it takes to, to work. But, uh, the, you know, thousands of hours have gone into getting to where we are today from, from the entire campus community, the, the Lawrence Douglas County community and, and health system, LMH and Watkins have just really, really worked hard to get us to where we are. But it's all, it's all there and we're happy to share. All right, and Carla wants to know, do we have patients that are on ventilators still when they're in the recovery phase? Mm -hmm. Yes, we actually do have, I think, four or five people who have met that criteria for being uh, past the acute infection and in the recovery phase. 
and for critically ill patients in the ICU, that is 20 days compared to 10 days from symptom onset for other mild to moderate disease. So we do have patients who remain on the ventilator, yes. All right, and Mike, he is a first responder. He just tested positive. He writes, I have a two-month-old at home and two kids under age seven. Mm -hmm. How can I keep my family safe from getting this as well? Any additional information would be greatly appreciated. Can you help, Mike? A great question, mm -hmm. hard question. Um, I think uh, to, to sort of think about putting um, us in, in your shoes right now, Mike. Uh, you know, Dana, I think for a long time now we've been talking about the process of isolation mm -hmm. and what that means. And um, that likely um, will mean that you're not going to see your children for a period yeah. of 10 days, if at all possible. Uh, understanding of the burden that that places on uh, the others in your household that help care for your children. Um, th the good news is we still know that when you do those things, uh, all of those things well, uh, isolating using the, um, the, the practices that we've talked about here, at length, uh, the, the rate of uh, secondary attack or transmission to family members, even in the same household, is, um, you know, by some studies, 30% or 40%, but it's definitely not 100%. So. Right. Yeah, I, I think we've kind of landed on the 20 to 30% um, secondary uh, attack rate or secondary infection rate within the household. You know, if you have a household that's big enough, move to an area where you can isolate yourself in a bathroom and bedroom. Um, have your food delivered if you can, um, you know, by people, other people who are living in the house. If you don't have a household that's big enough, try to stay distance as much, you, as much as you can from the other people in the household. Masking in the household is going to be very important uh, for the adults and the children that are uh, of age to mask. Obviously, for the v newborn, that's going to be difficult. But if you can do all those things um, for the next 10 days, you're going to reduce your risk of transmission to the other members of the household as much as you possibly can. Thanks, we Dan. have more questions, but I think we'll hold them till tomorrow um, and Friday. I also think, sadly, that we have technical problems with Chris and Dr. Scrimshire, but you can check. Okay. Well, as we prepare uh, to wrap up for the day, uh, tomorrow, Stephanie Baines, Education Coordinator in the Poison Control Center here at the University of Kansas Health System, uh, joins us to talk about Halloween safety. She's invited some very special guests. Mm -hmm. I think we have video. Yep, it's playing. Great, so the Mesner puppets, Hunter and Scout, will have questions for Dr. Stites and Hawkeye. Hunter and Scout uh, have quite a following, mm -hmm. actually, at area schools, <laughs> and so this is one morning update. You may want to encourage children at home to join tomorrow, so looking forward to that. Um, I hope that Hunter and Scout are uh, not too hard on <laughs> Dr. Stites mm -hmm. and Hawkinson. Um, before we wrap up, final thoughts today, Chancellor? Uh, well, we'll just uh, thank you again for all the help uh, of the team for what we're doing in, in Lawrence and Douglas County. Uh, we, we couldn't be more proud of where we are right now. Uh, we also know we've, we've got to stay the course. We're not there yet, so, um, uh, and we will we'll continue to do so. All right, Hawkeye? Yeah, I think just to echo what Dr. Durat said, stay the course. We are getting weary, it's tough. Some of these things um, are hard to do. They, be, they do become second nature. Certainly doing these things in addition to really the sun going away and seasonal affective disorder is gonna play a big role. But do those things that we've talked about um, the last couple days with ways to uh, cope and find joy as we move through uh, the fall and winter here. And I would share the same sentiments, don't let your guard down. Um, I think it, it's easy to, to find ourselves in familiar situations as we move inside and the weather gets cooler and holidays approach. I know we keep talking about that, but um, the stories of, of people um, in the last week or two that are testing positive, um, more and more stories of, I knew that this probably wasn't the right decision um, and I kind of did it anyway because it felt like I, I was safe or felt like maybe it was okay and, and now I find myself here and positive and so don't let, don't let your guard down. Um, on a separate closing thought, um, Jill is gonna hate me for this, <laughs> going off script, but um, That's fine. I had the opportunity to be challenged uh, this week in an interview. 
uh, by an applicant who asked a very, very thought-provoking question. And that question to me was, what do you think you are most proud of about your organization's response to the pandemic? And what would you say your employees would say they are most proud of about your organization's response to the pandemic? Um, and that was a table turning question uh, because uh, we were here obviously interviewing an applicant. And, and my answer was, uh, from my perspective, I'm most proud about the fact that we have worked very, very hard to be transparent and share facts. Um, and the team that pulls this update together every day and keeps us all in line, and if you don't know Hawkeye, keeping him in line is quite a chore. Uh, the team that does that really uh, here um, has been a huge part in making sure that we're sharing information that is true and factual and aimed at helping keep all of you out there watching safe and healthy. And so for that team, um, I say thank you. Uh, personally very much uh, for what you've been doing your part in that. Uh, I think the uh, answer that I gave to, to answer the second question about what do I think our employees would be most proud of, um, I think it's the fact that we worked very, very hard to make sure that we were protecting um, every job and making sure that um, we had the people here in our healthcare delivery system that we need to take great care of patients. Um, and I think both of those things are very easy to be proud of, and I am personally very proud of them. So on that note, um, we will end today with a very special American Hospital Association video, uh, a little bit of a thought-provoking public service announcement uh, to remind us of the importance of wearing masks. Um, we want to share it with you now as we prepare to say goodbye. Uh, be safe out there, take care, and we will see you tomorrow.